Members, visitors and guests, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our 47th meeting in our 101st year and our first hybrid Thomas, Thomas Baker oration where we are also zooming out to our members and guests online. President Marion could not be with us today. Unfortunately, I think many of you know that Marion's mother passed away last week and she is in, uh, in Tasmania with family. So I think uh, uh, our thoughts should go with, uh, with Marion. Today is an important day in the club's calendar with the fifth Thomas Baker oration to be delivered by Professor Margaret Gardner AC, President and Vice-Chancellor of Monash University. Margaret will be more formally introduced shortly by our Chair of the Day, past President Peter Rogers. In the meantime, if you could please acknowledge and make Margaret welcome. We are very honoured to have as our special guests, trustees of the Baker Foundation, Chairman Logan Armstrong and trustees John Turnbull, Kate Metcalf, Richard Balderstone, Gary Jennings and Rotarians Trevor Nink and Rob Nethercote. And Gary uh, is a past member of Melbourne and uh, welcome, uh, uh, welcome today. Also here as guests of Rotarians, uh, we have distinguished list of uh, members, including the inaugural uh, uh, Baker orator, Alan Finkel, University of Melbourne Thomas Baker Chair, Professor Lloyd Hollenberg, Sheena Watt, Victorian Member for Northern Metropolitan Region, and distinguished list of academic, academics from our Victorian universities and medical institutes. Would you please join me in acknowledging and making our club guests, guests of members and visitors all welcome. <laughs> and quickly to cl club notices, um, Queen's birthday honours. A quick scan of the Queen birthday honour list um, by our uh, eagle eye uh, uh, president uh, elect Reg Smith. Um, saw that CEO for the Sofitel, Clive Scott, um, well known to us all, um, has been a, an appointed a member in the Order of Australia. Um, for significant service to the hotel accommodation industry and to the arts. A letter of congratulations on behalf of members has been forwarded, uh, signed by President Marion. Would Chair of the Day, past President Peter Rogers, please come to the podium to take over today's meeting. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Vice President Chris. Uh, it gives me extraordinary pleasure to welcome you all to the 2021 Thomas Baker Oration, which commemorates the eighth president of the Rotary Club of Melbourne uh, and his contribution to industry, medical science and philanthropy. Uh, particularly among our guests are many representatives of, of our universities, some online, some here in face-to-face in -face contact. Uh, Rotary Melbourne has since its foundation a hundred years ago had a strong relationship with the universities. And this goes back to our founder and second president, Sir John Monash. Our first president was Professor William Alexander Osborne, who had been professor of physiology at the University of Melbourne, appointed in 1904. So he'd been in the job nearly 20 years when he became president of this club. Uh, and he was chairman of the professorial board. But like many early appointments to the universities in Melbourne, he was from overseas, he came from Northern Ireland, and he was very young and got a wonderful opportunity here. But our focus today is to commemorate the work and legacy of Thomas Baker. Our inaugural orator, Dr. Alan Finkel, the former chief scientist who's with us today, described Thomas Baker succinctly in these words. 
Born in Somerset, England in 1854, he came to Australia at the age of 11 in 1865. That happens to be the year that uh, Sir John Monash was born. So he was 11 years older than Sir John Monash. On finishing school, he worked first alongside his father as a blacksmith and coach builder and later as a pharmaceutical chemist. He married Alice Shaw, his partner in life, in business and in philanthropy in 1877. The Bakers moved to Melbourne in 1881, where Thomas had a go at studying medicine, but was distracted by the new craze for photography, just teetering on the brink of the mass market. He saw his opportunity. He set up as an importer and producer of photographic materials and rode the boom in amateur photography with stunning success. In just 13 years, he opened 14 stores in Melbourne, Adelaide, Brisbane, Hobart and Sydney. And let's not forget, he made the first X-ray film in Australia in 1924. So Thomas Baker made his fortune in high-tech devices and his fame in X-rays with the instincts of a born engineer. And it was a born engineer, Alan Finkel, who summarised um, Thomas Baker in those words. Particularly today, I'd like to recognise the trustees of the Baker Foundation who are present in the audience and who guard the legacy of Thomas Baker and carry on the philanthropic work that he commenced. Our speaker today for the 20 21 Thomas Baker oration is Professor Margaret Gardner, AC, Vice Chancellor of Monash University. Margaret Gardner has been in office since 2014, and during that time has played a leading role in the Group of Eight, uh, the major research universities in Australia. Before that, she was Vice Chancellor of RMIT from 2005 to 2014. So Margaret has been making a mark on Melbourne since 2005 at least. And Monash has maintained its position in the top 60 of the QS World University rankings for the last five years. Professor Gardner has led her university through a particularly challenging time for student teaching, research and financial sustainability through the COVID pandemic. The oration today hopefully will look ahead and open up our thinking about university, education, research and commercialisation post COVID. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gardner to the stage. Thank you, Peter, who's been associated with Monash and a very great supporter for much longer than I have been associated with the university. So thank you, Peter and good afternoon to everyone here. It's actually my great pleasure to be here for Rotary Melbourne's fifth annual Thomas Baker Oration. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today and I hope that you will not feel otherwise at the end of the speech. <laughs> um, today's event, as you've heard, is a much more intimate gathering than was first planned due to COVID-19 restrictions. Um, and so I am extending a warm welcome to everyone, those I can see here in the room and those who are joining virtually. Um, before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations, the Wurundjeri on whose unceded land we gather and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge Chris Stilwell, a Rotary Melbourne Vice President, whose 
hosting this year's oration. Um, yeah, from my point of view, it's wonderful to see Sheena Watt, the member for the Northern Metropolitan Region, to recognise Logan Armstrong and all the Baker Foundation trustees. Um, to note that, in fact, there are a number of people here who are Monash colleagues, and I say welcome <laughs> to you, but um, to note two people with particular other relationships to Melbourne, of course, one mentioned already, um, Dr Alan Finkel, AO, who has been mentioned as Australia's former chief scientist, which he was, and inaugural Thomas Baker orator, which he was, but he was also Monash University Chancellor, and luckily for me, the man who chose me uh, as, <laughs> as president and vice chancellor. Um, I'd also like to recognise the Right Reverend, the Honour, honor, the Honourable Dr. Peter Hollingworth, AC, former Anglican Archbishop of Brisbane, which is where I think I first we first met, 23rd Governor General of Australia, um, who was awarded an honorary doctorate by Monash on the occasion of its 25th anniversary, which seems not so long ago, but you will find is longer ago than I thought. And I couldn't begin without, of course, acknowledging Thomas Baker, who I'm not going to mention as, as an engineer, Having a son who's an engineer, I have to be careful about their overweening um, ambitions to take over the world. Um, Thomas Baker, after whom this oration is named, is, an, is from my point of view an innovator and an entrepreneur who left much of his wealth to medical research through the Baker Institute and Baker Foundation and from that generosity all communities benefit. And that is very important. So. I'm focusing this address today on the Australian university sector and what we might expect and hope from it, particularly in the post-COVID world. It doesn't feel very post at the moment, but we remain, we remain hopeful. The question I'm exploring is what might the new business model that government has exhorted universities to develop be? And what might it bring to our communities? So I'm having a little bit of an interrogation of the curious exhortations about new business models. But let me begin by giving you an example of something new developed to scale in the desperate days of the lengthy lockdown last year and deployed at speed again in the last two weeks when lockdown came again. Monash in the last two weeks has successfully provided 44,360 online invigilated exams to its students in the lockdown we just experienced. Nothing at Monash happens in small numbers. That's the first thing you should know. <clears throat> that's a very considerable number. And that's after last year. And of course, at very short notice, Monash before COVID had developed a set of computer-based examination types from standard essays through to mathematics, science and engineering problems and health and medical identifications of disease and injury. It's a very extensive type of sets of assessment types, well beyond the norm. And in the 2020 lockdown, that development was deployed to all exams, that is thousands of exams and students online. And one, but one issue, once you went online, remained to be solved. How are we to deal with cheating when people are remote and the usual army of invigilators uh, patrolling the aisles, it's not possible. Well, Monash developed its own e-invigilation platform, which I will tell you proved more robust, reliable and scalable than the then available commercial versions. And I think that remains the case today. This e-assessment is about to be recognised internationally by an award as the premier version to deal with this particular circumstance because it affected all education institutions worldwide. How do you assess people with integrity? Um, and most didn't. They just let them go online and hoped. Uh, so it's being recognised with this award and we are commercialising this platform, this educational innovation, and we've already provided it to other professional bodies who are seeking secure online examinations with academic integrity. So why do I give you this example? Well, assessment of knowledge is an old problem and it hasn't gone away and it won't go away. It's something you have to do if you educate. 
Second, educational innovation using digital means was already underway at Monash to modernise and improve assessment well before COVID, you know, lurched into view. What happened with COVID is circumstance provided the spur and the opportunity to develop faster, better modifications at scale. And Monash understood that the solution could be commercialised and moved to do so. So I leave you with that example because I know what people typically have in their head about commercialisation. It's important that you start from a different spot. Monash University is not as old as Rotary, <coughs> which here in Australia celebrates its centenary. It's 100 years here of members drawn from business and industry coming together to build relationships for the greater good of their communities. Monash is only 60 years older than when it took its first students, although, as we know, universities are a venerable type of institution more long lived than most. Universities also find their purpose in their contribution to the betterment of their communities. And this is worth emphasising when I began with an example of innovation and its commercialisation. In Monash's founding legislation in 1958, the then State of Victoria set out a very broad purpose for this new university. To quote from not all, but just some of the lengthy list of objectives, the university, in any branch of learning, the university shall aim to foster a desire for learning and culture and for a knowledge of the social and cultural as well as the technical and practical aspects of that branch of learning and an understanding of its relation to the whole field of human life and knowledge. Monash was founded in the midst of post-World War II enthusiasm for the benefits of increased scientific and technological capacity, but its contribution was almost immediately seen as far beyond the original notion of a technology university for Victoria. The first graduating class was dominated by arts, medicine, economics and politics, rather than engineers and scientists. Yet from its beginnings, apart from the critical attention to new graduates, it was also expected, and this is again from the founding legislation, to aid the advancement of knowledge, and here is the second bit, and its practical application to primary and secondary industry and commerce. And of course, as many people here will know, its founding governing body was in fact dominated by representatives of industry. We're more than half a century from the way post-World War II prosperity shaped and reshaped what was expected and what was done by Australian universities. This pandemic is shifting much in our experience and our expectations of the future. It has had immediate and profound effects alongside shifts in the global order and, our, and in our physical environment that are anticipated to bring other likely as well as unpredictable changes in our world. So it's not a very certain future we look out to. Australia has discovered and rediscovered some key community needs as well as aspirations that have begun to colour government expectations of universities. In the pandemic, Australian universities pivoted around at great speed, shared their knowledge, evidence and ideas with the public through new research from new tests for COVID through to new vaccines, interpretation of evidence from efficacy of vaccines through to epidemiological models, and ideas about what might change from how we design cities, transport networks and buildings through to new programs to combat family violence and improve mental health. There were tens of thousands of pieces of advice and staff engaged in all these aspects of what was a very tumultuous encounter with COVID. And so if anybody needed reminding here in all this work was the importance of evidence and careful analysis to policy response, of professional expertise to understanding and treating disease, of new ideas to giving us the means to overcome threats and dangers in our world, and all of it was dependent in very substantial part on education, on the people universities had educated 
and the research that emanated from our universities. But the pandemic impressed upon us one other important lesson. When borders close, our world may seem safer from disease, but it is more vulnerable to dearth and shortage. Suddenly, into an Australian economy, which has been devoted for most of all our working lives here to open borders and trade as the means to prosperity, came the issue of sovereign capability. And that had not been seen, I would argue to you, as a national is issue since World War II. So into this, therefore, comes government expectations because suddenly we have an issue, as do many other countries in different ways, around sovereign capability. So when the new Federal Minister for Education, Alan Tudge, gave his first speech about Australian universities in February this year, he laid out his key priorities. His first and major priority is research, commercialisation and industry collaboration. And what he said was this, we want and need our universities to play a bigger role, to not just produce brilliant, pure research, but to work more with businesses and governments to translate this research into breakthrough products, new businesses and ideas to grow our economy and strengthen our society. He made clear that Australia need, needed to strengthen its ability to produce key products key, essential to our health and security and graduates who had the knowledge and capabilities to participate in, in those endeavours. His predecessor, Minister Tian, had in 2020 changed the legislation funding university education with the objective of encouraging more Australian students into science, engineering and health professions. So we have two federal education ministers. They've got clear policy priorities and we've had some legislative change. And accompanying all of that was considerable discussion of international education and its future role. Currently, and since February 2020, as you all know, there is no permission for international students enrolled in Australian universities to come to Australia. Well over 120,000 international students are currently studying offshore and online while hoping to return to Australia on campus. There has been considerable public just I want you to just take in that number when you think about pilot programs of 250 back every two weeks. Because <laughs> um, they're all hoping to study on campus. Hmm. There's been considerable public comment, including from the federal government, about the need for Australian universities to diversify, in inverted commas, and decrease dependence on international student revenue. This has been outlined as the reason for Australian universities to find new business models. At present, the federal gov government's express priorities are, as I said, research commercialisation and a focus on educating Australian students in our universities. I will say as an aside, it's important to note in relation to Australian students that before the border closures, that is, before the border closures, some 70% of the students studying in Australian universities were domestic students. The funding landscape for educating Australian students changed in 2020 with the legislation Minister Tian introduced, and it changed at the same time as borders were closed to international students. These changes also affected Australian government research funding, a matter currently subject to consultation by the federal government. These are all key elements of what universities provide that is necessary to power post-COVID recovery and innovation. So let me turn to that first key element for recovery, innovation and building sovereign capability because that's, that's what's needed. And the first key element is talented and skilled people or in the particular case of universities graduates. The changes to higher education funding for domestic students that were put in place in 2020 by Minister Tien in what is known as the Job Ready Graduates Package 
were complex and profound in ways that are yet to be fully revealed. It's often the case with legislation, it'll take you five to 10 years before you see the full ramifications. But this is what it has done from now. On average, the government decreased its contribution to Australian domestic university students' education from 58% to 51%. And it increased the student contribution on average from 42% to 49%. So Australian domestic students are paying, a, on average, a very high proportion of the cost of their, the total cost of their degrees. Um, and they are relatively high fees compared to much of the rest of the world. It, did, it made these two shifts on average, and I said they were on average, by subst increasing substantially the student contribution to degrees in humanities, social science, business and law, and decreasing the student contributions to science, engineering, nursing, health sciences, education. As noted above, this major change in student contributions were premised on the idea that this would create an incentive for students to undertake, for example, science and engineering rather than humanities and social science, therefore contributing to the capability of the workforce. To quote Minister Tian, he said, the power to power our post-COVID economic recovery, Australia will need more educators, more health professionals and more engineers. There they are again. <laughs> and that is why, more engineers, and that is why we are sending a price signal to encourage people to study in areas of expected employment growth. Many commentators noted almost immediately that the decrease in the government contribution, alongside the price signal that science and engineering students were paying less, meant that universities were in total receiving less funding to teach science and engineering than before, making it more difficult for universities to increase the number of places in these fields. These are the unintended consequences that one finds sometimes in legislation. So the changes made to this funding, there's something more significant than that attempt to, in, to create an incentive for students, but which turned out to be no, in, no incentive to produce more places in those areas. The changes made to this funding were also based on a calculation of the cost of teaching these subjects. Now, this was actually a profound change from 2021 the notion that some of the funding that was received for education through the government was for research or for facilities and equipment rather than directly teaching students ended. Prior to this, universities spent about 10% of that government teaching funding on non-teaching such as research and facilities. That's all gone. Recent analysis by the Parliamentary Library, so not coming out of universities, no conflict of interest here, by the Parliamentary Library, shows that higher education expenditure by government is set to decrease in real terms from 2021 and by 2023-24 will fall to the same level in real funding as it was in 2010, when there were many fewer Australian students in universities. There is a looming increase of school leavers resulting from the, whether you call it the Costello baby boom or the baby blip from 2004 to 14, coming. And there is currently in all the forward estimates, no increase in funding for university places for domestic students. The ability to build key workforce capabilities for an economy seeking to supply increased investment in infrastructure and modern manufacturing, for example, as well as increased support for health and social services, is unlikely to be supplied from a domestic graduate pool, which is not growing. On the data of the five years to 2019, Australia was producing around 196,000 graduates per year. These are domestic and a relatively stable 41% over that period of those graduates were in science, engineering, IT and health, and health was almost 50% of them. So you've got a stable pool, a need for post-COVID recovery, an ambition for sovereign capability, and no funding for more 
domestic students and a lot of school leavers coming down the pike hoping to go to Monash. <clears throat> Without more graduates overall, the post-COVID recovery depends in part on a major shift in the number of graduates in key fields and the only plan currently in place is that in the existing pool, students will move out of humanities and social science and law and into science and engineering. They've got to move in very big numbers before you get very significant increased capacity. So this is, we have just experienced a major change in funding policy, but without yet any indication of a clear investment to meet what we know on the, on the demographic projections is a clear student demand or to assure an increase in graduates in the key priority fields the government's suggested. What happens if there aren't enough skilled graduates? And what about government priorities for education innovation, which is where I started with an education innovation, or leadership in the quality of education? Where will investment in this area come from? So I'll just leave you to contemplate those questions as I move to the second key element in the post-COVID recovery, which is research. Be under no illusion, Australia has very high quality research. You can cut the international rankings whichever way you like. And I, I notice that Peter Rogers has mentioned QS. QS, it's not my favourite ranking. It's not very heavily research weighted. Uh, we do sit in the top 60. We actually sit in the top 50, Monash, in the US News and World Report Global University rankings, which are based entirely on research. Um, and the point is that in international rankings that look at research, and that's mostly what they look at, Australia has far more universities in the top 100 in the world than any other nation apart from the United States and the United Kingdom, who are respectively one and two. And it has more universities in the top 100 per million of population than any country I know except Switzerland. Unlike many other nations, Australian universities undertake a much higher proportion of all the research and development in Australia. It's the eighth highest in the OECD at 35% of all R&D in Australian universities. Australia's universities do 90% of this nation's discovery research, that's new knowledge, and 42% of all its applied research. That is a higher proportion than the applied research that is done in industry. However, Australia is very low on rankings of global innovation. Gross expenditure in R&D in Australia has been declining since 2008. It's fallen from 2.25% of GDP in 2008 to 1.79% in 2017. And let me point out that fall is in the context in which the average investment of OECD countries in research and development has been climbing. The OECD finds Australia is very low on firms collaborating on innovations with universities. Indeed, we rank, guess what, 28 out of 28, where 28 is not the top but the bottom, uh, and 20 of 28 on business-funded research and development in the higher education and government sector. It's not a pretty story. And it's that data that fuels the government's call for greater university industry collaboration and greater commercialisation commercialisation of Australian university research. And, and that call is worth pursuing. It's just it's a more complex picture than is revealed by any of those indices. So I just want to take you to a couple of examples. So of commercialisation and translation at Monash. So Amero, which some of you will know well. Amero is a listed, it's a spin out from Monash, a listed company on the ASX with a current market cap of about 120 million. Its headquarters are in Clayton, next to the Monash Research Group that developed the additive manufacturing capability that it has taken to market. It has facilities in South Australia and also in the United States near Boeing. It works closely with all the major aircraft manufacturers that is Airbus, Boeing, 
So Airbus in Europe, you know, Boeing in the United States and Comac in China. This is the type of company that is the basis of modern manufacturing in Australia. Then it's all ours. Because those aircraft companies don't have to come to us for that sort of work unless we can actually beat everybody else in the global market. It was spun out of Monash and there was a considerable period of time, some of you have more of the details of this than others, when Monash maintained its investment in that company to keep it going and supported its development and eventually secured investment from Innovis, who are fabulous, and who are vital to creating its future, which I think is, is I think will be great. Monash recently launched a very new company called Jupiter Ionics, which is focused on green ammonia, which is vital to lowering emissions from fertiliser production, so important, which is so important to agriculture. And um, fertiliser production is the third highest, that, that um, fertiliser is the third highest emitter. So you want to get that down if you're going to take global emissions down. Um, the research makes possible renewable powered, lower cost production and has the possibility of replacing fossil fuels because it also allows hydrogen production, which takes you into areas of shipping transport and the like. I won't go into all the detail. Monash is not the only university re researching in this space. And the issue we face is the investment to scale that research up to production. Again, this is the type of innovation and company that builds new green production and new energy possibilities for Australia. And it's there, and it's sitting on our investment currently, <laughs> as our spin out. There are two examples, and I wanted to give them to you because one has secured investment, is on a strong path, the other is at the beginning of the process and needs support. There is currently no proof of concept or translation funding from government in Australia outside health and medical sciences. And these are both engineering and science developments. And therefore promising developments such as those are at risk of not reaching their potential in scale or in the time it takes, because the world is not waiting, or in the time it takes for the benefits for Australia to be secured. So let me go to the rest of the complex story of research and its path to translation. Um, the business sector reduced its contribution to R&D in Australia between 2008 and 2018 from 61 to 53%. Universities and higher education increased their contribution from 24 to 34% in the same period and higher education expenditure on R&D increased by 179% from around 4.4 billion in 2000 to 12.2 billion. That's what we spend on research in Australian universities, 12.2 billion in 2018. And much of that increase came from internal university funds. In 2018, 56.1%, that is 6.8 billion of that research expenditure came from university funds and 29.5% from Australian government grants and the rest from other grants. So that's money you've made somewhere else and you've invested in research. In other words, in a landscape of declining investment in research and development, Australian universities invested from the funds they earned and most of those funds came from student fee income. So universities made significant contributions from their own resources and 48% of that research that Australian universities undertook was applied research. So on the path to translation. So despite the apparently barren story I've just told you of university industry collaboration in Australia, which is drawn from the OECD statistics, it's not, all, not all entirely bleak. Um, Australia also ranked 13 out of 35 for the proportion of industry university collaborative patent applications. And Australia's in the top 10 for 
and here is the same story again in a different form, in the top 10 for patents filed by a university. Indeed, in the latest review of patents filed in Australia, so these are patents filed in Australia, not elsewhere, the top five Australian organisations were two companies, I can tell you their names, two universities, Sydney and Monash, and CSIRO. They were the top five Australian patent filers last year. And in Australia, it turns out that industry turns to universities for research at a higher level. So there may be less overall going on, but what is going on um, is, is actually higher than happens in the UK and close to the same level, but it's as a proportion, not in scale. <laughs> Um, in Germany, and our problem's proportion. Just to give you the scale, in 2020, Monash made 116 invention disclosures, filed 51 new patent families. We managed 350 patent families. We had 24 spin-outs and start-ups, and we earned 298 million in Category 3, which is industry research income. And I can tell you on all those numbers, that puts us anywhere between one and three in all the universities in Australia. Um, but that Monash story, is not so dissimilar to other large group of eight universities because we just jostle around, you know, so it's one here, two, three, you know, sort of. Currently, Monash's commercialisation revenue is in millions, not billions. And along with other GO8s, it's more likely to be annually below 10 million than above 20 million. And you need to put that in the context that Monash's annual revenue is about 2.5 billion. So, research and translation is very, very important for the future of Australian innovation and universities import, are important and they're more important than Australia and many other countries because they're so central to research in Australia. We do need the re-examination that's currently underway of the incentives to encourage greater collaboration on and investment by industry in research in Australia. Greater engagement is necessary for Australia's future. But Australia's research funding and its ability to support translation of that research to, to services or products or practices has been dependent on Australian universities' ability to earn income, particularly international student income. There is no replacement government funding for the research funding that was lost when it disappeared, so to speak notionally from the job ready graduates package. And there is as yet, because we're in consultation, no suggestion about how the current shortfall as university revenues continue to decline, and they are, how it will be mitigated. But there's one and two of the elements of a post COVID recovery, both very important, both needing policy. So let's go back to those new business models. Research translation and commercialisation is very important for the Australian economy, but it will not fund, so it's very important, has to be, has to be driven. It will not fund future research and innovation in Australian universities. There's no way any Australian university is going to be funding world quality research off those returns. It's not possible. Important for the country. Cutting domestic contrib student contributions to prior priority fields of study in the context of an overall decline in government funding for Australian university education will not produce significant increases in the number of graduates necessary for recovery, productivity and innovation in the Australian economy. They don't add up. When borders closed, Australia was the third most popular country for international students. We're 38% smaller than the UK and we were, had almost the same number of students. We were just behind the United Kingdom with the United States as number one. International students made up at their peak about one third of the total student population in Australian universities, one third. And over 45% of those students at the end were in postgraduate study. So they came in as graduates. It generated over 40 billion in export income in 2019, of which uh, some 47% was international student fees for higher education providers. 
The decline in international student commencements from 2019 to 2020 was over 20% and the highest fall was in Victoria, which was in excess of that. The federal bu budget suggests that international students may not return until the second half of 2022. International students have made clear with domestic students that their preference is for on-campus, in-country education, not online. Australia has developed capacity for more online education, which is seen as another potential uh, part of a new business model. So has the rest of the university world. <laughs> our comparative advantage with international students to date has been international quality of our universities in a safe, secure and beautiful environment. It's an advantage that's not so clear in online education. Talk of new business models implies there are new sources of funding that have not been properly explored. Further exploration will continue. It needs to continue. But we have to ask what is actually possible with the rapid declines in revenue that are underway. The current funding model, which has been encouraged and supported by the federal government of various political persuasions for decades, is based on filling government funding shortfalls in the cost and scale of research facilities and equipment to support education and research and shortfalls in the cost of domestic education as well as funding investment in education innovation and spin outs from the successful export of education services. That's the business model that was countenanced. That's the business model that produced what I just told you about. The current responses to declining revenue in universities have reduced capital expenditure in universities, reduced staff numbers, reduced other operating expenses, drawn on reserves and increased borrowing. That's not a new business model. That's called a response to a crisis. So let me remind all of us of the purpose of universities, which is not their sole purpose is not to invest and expend only on that which will return a surplus or make a commercial return. Because that's what's implied in those business models, that somehow there will be enough earned that it will, it will deal with all the shortfalls in the ability to fund research or the cost of domestic education or inducing more students to do engineering or whatever. So let me go back to Newman, the famous Newman, and the much quoted source of university purpose and remind you that this is what he said. It is the great ordinary means to a great but ordinary end. It aims at raising the intellectual tone of society, at cultivating the public mind, at purifying the national taste, at supplying true principles to popular enthusiasm and fixed aims to popular aspiration, at facilitating the exercise of political power and refining the intercourse of private life. You can tell Newman thought there wasn't much that couldn't be done and the purpose was broad. There is much to be brought to Australia, its people, and to the world from the education and research in Australian universities, and there has been much that is being and has been brought. Yet if we choose to refocus on Australia and its sovereign capacity, and I'm not saying that's not worth focusing on, we have to understand and make the policy choices to invest in those priorities. They're not gonna happen by chance. When research in Northern Australia on the impact of introducing Wolbachia bacteria to mosquitoes showed that it would prevent the spread of vector-borne diseases such as dengue and Zika, translation of that research began. Philanthropic funds from the Gates Foundation through to the Wellcome Trust and many other individual philanthropists alongside research funding allowed the creation of the World Mosquito Project at Monash it has just demonstrated in a controlled trial in Indonesia that it can prevent those diseases at a high level of efficacy by modifying the mosquito population. It is on the way to doing what it first said it would do, eliminate dengue. There is no commercial return to Monash from that translation. Its major impact is on the health of populations in the tropical world who are overwhelmingly disadvantaged populations. This project is supported by philanthropy and Monash. 
It has offices in Vietnam and South America and staff employed right across the world. This is a truly great example of research translation. It is what we should expect of our universities. It is not the only project of this ambition type and scale at Monash. International student revenue enabled Monash to support research such as this and its translation beyond any government industry or philanthropic grant, because that project would not be there, but for all the, <laughs> all the funding we've got sitting behind it one way or another over a very long period of time. So let me conclude with just this thought. It isn't the business models of universities that need changing. We need to re-engage as a community with their broad purpose. And they do have a broad purpose. That engagement needs to happen through our communities. Their support, your support, to understanding and creating the real opportunities that can be realised from Australian universities and that are before us in a post-COVID world won't happen. It won't happen without your support. There isn't a new business model that is going to fuel this recovery on those key elements without making a concerted community decision about how you're going to invest and do it. And that's my message to you. Thank you. Margaret, that was extraordinary. Thank you. Um, the um, impressions that I'm left with are we've got a very high quality university sector. Um, you mentioned some dimensions of that, the patent performance, the percentage of knowledge that's produced in the country, the quality of our research, uh, but yet a perfect storm is emerging. And um, I think you've given to us a good picture of that today. And I think I would speak for everybody here uh, in saying that we feel that the education system is in very good hands. Uh, and if anybody's going to help us sort this through with our help, it's you. So on behalf of us all, thank you very much for presenting the 2021 Thomas Baker Oration. Thank you very much. Uh, and to, um, to show our appreciation, a small gift, uh, can I say, Margaret, it includes a history of the club of 100 years ago um, and a pair of Rotary 100 socks. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what colour they are, but I hope they, they'll be the right colour for your sporting activity. Again, into, into the rowing boat with the socks, yes. Again, thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you to our online guests and thank you to our members and guests that are with us today. If you'd like to know more about Rotary and what Rotary does, feel free to talk to Peter, myself or any other of the members in the room. A reminder that next week's meeting is the annual Vice President's Reporting Day, which will be Vice President Pam and yours truly. And we'll be telling you and sharing with you stories about the club's works over the last year. Uh, the meeting will be at level 35, health settings permitting, and at this stage we'll be working with a 50 uh, attendee cap, um, but do watch your emails on Friday or during the weekend uh, for any updates on that. Um, Reg has organised test run two of the hybrid option, and uh, I think Reg is sitting there with anticipation that the internal sound um, will be a, a better experience. So please stand for, are we standing for the national anthem or are we, uh, um, so I'm not much of a singer. 
So thank you very much for our lead singers for bailing me out on that one and have a great week. Thank you.